Good morning. Uh, welcome back to Saturday Somethings. I'm excited to have a very special guest today. This is Kadreen, um, joining us from Oran Swift Wines. Um, these wines are huge. have been like wonderful, wonderful sellers in the store and then also regionally for a long time. The history of these wines is really cool. Um, I'm kind of thrilled to get a chance to taste these wines. I haven't tasted these in years. Um, back to Steakhouse days, we worked with Palermo and Mercury Head and these big wines and they were incredibly popular. Uh, Prisoner as well, we kind of touch on the connection there too. Um, did a really, really good job of increasing Denver's wine scene popularity. I think the weight and the textures of these wines make them stand out from a lot of what's on the market. So they're instantly accessible, enjoyable and thrilling. I'm going to a baby shower after this and I'm excited to have a little buzz. These are not your breakfast wines, um, but again, really excited. Um, yeah. Kadreen, welcome. Thank you. Um, we are thrilled to have you and excited to keep this partnership going in the future too. Absolutely. Uh, celebrating the relationship. Now, as I said, I haven't tasted these in quite some time, so I'm going to let you school me, educate me, give me all the presentation, and then of course we'll have some nerdy wine questions to throw in there too. Absolutely. If you want to introduce yourself and maybe talk a little bit about the Dave Finney story and the history and get us all caught up. So I am uh, Kurti Natsuka. So I, I hold my WSET diploma and I'm an educator here in Colorado, as well as working and representing the, the wines from Orrin Swift. Uh, Dave Finney, uh, most people may know Dave because he made the famous blend, The Prisoner. Uh, he started his winery in 1998 after he moved to California in 97. His first harvest was actually at Robert Mondavi Winery. Uh, and his first vintage of Orrin Swift was in 98 with a ton of Zin that failed miserably. <laughs> he ended up selling it all off as bulk juice and tried to get in 99 and did successfully make 100 cases of Zin in 99, but 2000, another terrible vintage for Napa Valley, he uh, harvested all of the Zin and realized he couldn't make a Zin dominant or Zin labeled wine. Uh, so he threw everything else he had in the winery into the blend and that was the, the birth of the Prisoner, which became a very famous red blend and put Dave on the map as the master blender for Napa Valley. The other thing that Dave is credited for as you can see by the labels, is his graphics. Uh, Dave loves to say that he's a graphic designer at heart. Uh, he loves the creative process in making the labels, uh, and that's part of his job. He, he handles vineyard work, he handles cellar work, and he handles the labels and packaging themselves. And he's very into the whole creative process that goes into the label creation. And he, his whole goal was to create something that spoke about him, spoke about the, the wines that he was making, and really just popped on the shelves. It was not traditional by any means. Um, these were, I mean, in the early 2000s, you would never have seen a label like this on a wine shelf. Mm -hmm. So these definitely stood out at the time. I think, too, another thing that is noticeable is that the weight yes. of these bottles, they, yep. they're, they already kind of set a tone. It's like when you have a really fancy glass yep. and you pick up a nice delicate glass, all of a sudden, like, the biggest... 300 pound dude all of a sudden becomes very elegant and graceful with a little glass. But then the same thing I think also happens, it just sets the mood and the tone for what you're about to drink. Like, yep. This is not pretending to be 7.5% Moscato no. at all. <laughs> no, this is all about luxury and top quality. That is Dave's mission every, every single vintage is to make the best wine that he can. He will never say that he's ever made his favorite wine. Um, every single vintage, he's striving to make something better than the last vintage. So it's uh, he's always starting over every single vintage, which is pretty cool. Awesome. I like that. We were talking earlier but um, with the releases of these wines, the next round of vintages that are about to release, and we might have an opportunity to have two different vintages of the same wine on the shelf at the same time, which I always think is really exciting because I think I've always felt when I talk about vintages with the consumer that a lot of the New World wines, the weather is so consistent that there's not often a lot of vintage variants. But I think there is a lot to be said for being a touch patient with some of these wines, especially these big ones that have such great structure, to let them evolve, see how they age. And, you know, it's not going to be quite as dramatic as a European microclimate, terrible vintage versus a perfect growing conditions. Uh, so I think it's nice to show that there's something special about New World wines year after year after year and not to just assume it's the same. 
and it's not a lesser quality wine because of that, there's still a lot of nuance to be seen. Yep. So. And, and two, with Dave, he has built his credibility on being an amazing blender. Uh, so even in poor vintages, like the two his first vintages of The Prisoner in 2000, he had to work with what he had, and that's what he's always doing. If he has, you know, Chardonnay is picked out of bricks that he's not necessarily thrilled with, and the, you know, the development, the phenolog uh, phenological ripeness isn't there, he'll blend something else in to help balance the wine out. And that's always been his theory, he's always strived to make a quality wine, even in a poor vintage. Mm -hmm. He will do what he needs to to, to make that work. Okay, awesome. Well, let's get into the mannequin. So again, we're talking about labels. Beautiful label, um, definitely eye-catching, yes. for sure. And just reading on the label, it's like a 15.1%, 15.2 Chardonnay, which is kind of intimidating, but I'm gonna go for it. So. I you always tell people not to pay attention to alcohol until after they taste it, because you're often shocked. Right. Um, he does an amazing job of integrating his alcohol into his wines, because they do not, I, when I tasted his first vintage of his Pinot Noir, which was slander, I could have sworn that ABV was right around 14, maybe sub 14 for Pinot Noir, and then I flipped the bottle over and it was 15.2, and I was just like, oh. Okay, Amazing. this is a <coughs> really nice Pinot Noir. <laughs> and I think that's nice too with alcohol when you don't notice the alcohol. Yep. And it's definitely a sign of a well-balanced wine. This like right off the bat, like it's rich, but it's not no. that. There's, a, there's not screaming acid, but there is a little bit in there. So it does help kind of offset the texture and the weight of that on the palate. Yep. And my mouth is still salivating again. That's always a great sign. Um, why is it so good? So, the, <laughs> the first, the, the, this was a wine that was actually built off of the label itself. Um, usually Dave has a blend or a wine style. He's already, he already has in mind and then the label comes second or third. Uh, but he, he had this label concept already fleshed out before he decided to make the wine. Uh, when he knew he was gonna have a wine named Mannequin, which is after a Nicki Minaj song, <laughs> that was his inspiration. He's so trendy. Uh, he is, he's very trendy. <laughs> Uh, he knew that it had to be a white wine, and so the first actually few vintages of Mannequin were a white blend. Uh, it always had Chardonnay in it, but uh, the first renditions had Vignet, Samuel Blanc, Roussan Marsan, um, and some other heritage white varietals coming out of Northern California. Uh, and over time, he just got better and better access to higher quality Chardonnay vineyards. So okay. over time, it started to become more and more Chardonnay heavy. So he finally was able to label it 100 percent chard or label it Chardonnay as of the 2016 vintage, uh, and the reason being is he needed Chardonnay that had acid, okay. and that was the big thing was finding vineyards that he could source off of that had that cool climate diurnal shift that retained their acidity. So like Santa Lucia Highlands, some of our fruit comes from the Sleepy Hollow Vineyard uh, yeah. uh, in Santa Lucia Highlands. So you get super high acid there. Some Sonoma Coast vineyards um, off Annapolis Ridge. And then Stagecoach, that's where you get all the weight for the Chardonnay. It's got that beautiful texture, that tropical fruit. Uh, and he does do lees aging and lees stirring on this, but he's not doing a, hun like a ton of new oak. Okay. And I think you could tell just by the balance of this sure. wine. Um, I was going to ask about the vineyards too. I've been to Stagecoach and that's a beautiful location. Yep. And the story on how that vineyard was put together. <laughs> dump trucks and dump trucks and dump trucks of rock being like moved so they could actually get a path up to the vineyards there. And all done by hand, which yeah. is insane. <laughs> yeah, I really like this wine. It has a lot on the nose that reminds me of some higher quality white burgundy. So it kind of coasts into that roasted pineapple, upside down mm -hmm. pineapple pancake type thing. If you ate at Snooze, you'll remember those. Yes. They're delicious. <laughs> um, but yeah, I actually really like this. Again, maybe not my first choice breakfast wine, but certainly I could take this down at lunchtime, dinner time. And it's nice. I think a lot of Chardonnay lovers will recognize fruit in this, but then also get a hint at the quality that you're getting out of this bottle versus maybe other ones at a lesser price point. And this isn't even that much. It's like $34. And of course, we'll have a little light sale discount on that too. And pretty good availability. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this Chardonnay, I mean, he built a Chardonnay for Chardonnay lovers without it being overly oaky, because that used to be the big style. Uh, so, yeah, it's cool. gorgeous. I like it. All right, well, let's go on to the abstract. So, next wine. So, 
you're not tasting. It has <laughs> been tasted and made sure that it's okay. So I'm just going to pour myself a little something. Um, and you want to talk about the label on here, maybe the blending. Absolutely. Um, so Dave sold Prisoner in 2008 to Huneus Group, who then sold it to Constellations. But in 2008, he had to sign a non-compete contract. He could not touch or work with Zinfandel for eight years. Oh. So when he did that, he had to come up with a new red blend, okay. which was the birth of Abstract. It is Grenache-based. That's actually one of his favorite varietals to work with. Uh, so he really wanted to bring attention to Grenache in California. And so this will always be a Grenache-dominant blend, followed by Syrah and Petit Syrah, depending on the vintage. Um, the first rendition of this wine actually got in trouble for copyright infringement because the Elvis on the label was a lot bigger, a lot mm -hmm. more prominent. The glasses weren't scratched out. John Wayne, his mouth, if I can find it, yep, here it is. His mouth wasn't adulterated on the original label, and that's why he got in, in trouble for copyright infringement. Is so, that Prince? Yep, Prince is on there. The Queen is on here. Ernest Hemingway is on here. Oh, fine. Uh, but they're all uh, labels that he clipped out of magazines while traveling um, across the globe because Dave's also responsible for locations, which is a wine that's sourced from different regions in the world. And so he's always on the plane. He's always traveling. He's always um, in airports, stuck on trains. So he was always just flipping through uh, magazines. Nat Geo is one of his favorites, and he would just cut out pictures that he liked. And eventually he had enough to create this collage. So he redid the collage after the original vintage and changed some of the pictures. He put a mustache on the queen uh, so he could call it his own artwork. <laughs> I just noticed something too, that this little mugshot reminds me of the... Linger has that, their bathrooms have yep. the mugshots yep. Yep. of like, Harry and Maude, yep. I think. It just reminded me of that. Yes. Cool. So there's over 230 labels on this collage, and it took him four weeks to hand create himself. He, he basically had his big desk, and he just put all the pictures together until he got it right. Nice. Um, but yeah, just a beautiful blend, like I said, Grenache heavy. Uh, and it's just a representation of what California is, because this wine is sourced from all different parcels throughout California. It's showcasing not only the sunshine and the ripeness that you get for these grapes, but the balance that you also see from the northern part of California. I'm going to say, how do you think California Grenache compares to um, Grenache from, say, the Rhone Valley? And what are the stylistic Very or different. <laughs> yep. So he also creates Department 66, mm -hmm. which is his French uh, uh, Moray project in southern France which is Old Vine Grenache. And if you taste, I love tasting abstract next to D66 because you see where terroir comes from. You see that minerality. It's spicier. It's not as lush. It's not as ripe. Um, it's definitely more savory. Uh, and that's really the depiction of Grenache grown in a really warm climate versus a cooler, cooler moderate climate. Oh. <laughs> so. And does the percentage of Grenache change year to year? Yes. Depending on what's going on? And he never releases his wine making to any of us. Okay. So we know some of the vineyard sourcing just because we know where he, he's been in the vineyards, but right. we don't know how percentages. Awesome. Um, and like this, it's also a powerful wine. Um, it's very lush. The texture on it is yep. incredibly smooth. Um, I would have a hard time picking out the Grenache and Petite Syrah in there because I think sometimes with these big red blends, it's just so boisterous and fruit forward. It's just tasty and delicious, and I don't need to sit and analyze it and be overcomplicated, yep. like uber nerdy. It's just tasty. It's just and easy it's, to drink. Yeah, <laughs> it's like chewy. Um, so let us go on to this bottle that has not yet been opened because there's an opportunity to show us all how to open these wax cap bottles without making a disastrous mess. So everybody, I mean, Camus has the wax cap bottles for bell gloss. The easiest way, because I've seen so many people cut their hands open when they try to pick the wax away, is just to put your corkscrew straight through. You gotta make sure your corkscrew is sharp though, so it can pick, pierce the wax, and then you're gonna go straight into the cork. And it can take some finesse. There you go, yeah. and it just pops straight off. Nice. So you could see it, it breaks the seal, there's no flaking. You're not going to get any wax in your wine if you just do a clean uh, break like that. Cool. Well, there we go. Nice. Can I pour you a glass? Please, that would be fabulous. 
So this is the machete. Yep. And also a super label. And James is pointing out to the bottle, like underneath. I don't know if you, now this open, it's kind of hard to hold it out, but the punt is so deep in there. Yep. And there's a story behind that. So it, it's all about the perception, again, going to the heavy glass and the perception of, of quality and value. He wanted to create a project that you knew what you were getting. You knew you were getting a beautiful, high quality wine. And most consumers, if you go through analytics and data, they associate quality with weight, <laughs> which is not so great for sustainability, but it is uh, great for that perception. So he wanted a big, heavy bottle. And to do that, that's why there's such a deep punt. Um, he also wanted a burgundy-shaped bottle versus a Bordeaux bottle. Again, that deep punt is because of that. Mm -hmm. um, machete. So machete is a fun story because it's the exact opposite of abstract. It's petite Syrah heavy okay. with Syrah and Grenache as the blending components. So it's fun to taste those side by side because you can really see, to, back to your earlier observation of what is Grenache and what is petite Syrah. Because I think mm -hmm. these two kind of show the, the different characteristics. It's going to instantly, that it's big and spicy. Yep. All right. When you get people who come in, they want a dry wine, they want a spicy wine, and a full-bodied wine. This hits all those points. Um, I want barbecue right now. <laughs> Just, so if know. we get snow tonight like we're mm -hmm. supposed to, this with short ribs is mm -hmm. amazing <laughs> on a really cold night. So. Um, our, our dear friend Mots has already called dibs on the leftovers yes. for this. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I don't blame him. It's, it's a really fun bottle of wine. But that Petit Syrah is just staining. Like it's boysenberry, blueberry, just really rich, really decadent. Mm. Um, mm. It's definitely a mouthful. So. I remember a um, different winery had described some of their wines as molar coaters. Yep. So the wine just like coats your molars and stains them. This is absolutely one of those. Yep. And I don't know, I definitely pick up the oak more on this too. Yes. So there's a ton of vanilla in here. It's almost desserty. It's not a sweet wine by any means, but it has like really indicators, like sweet indicators that kind of remind yep. people of other flavors. But definitely. It's a huge. So I, eight months on abstract and 12 months okay. on uh, machete for oak. So that is another big difference. And a lot of times at wine dinners, when we are doing an orange whip dinner, we will actually pair machete with dessert. So mm -hmm. it works really well with dark chocolate. So that's mm -hmm. my recommendation if you want a great non-dessert wine for dessert. Yeah. I love <laughs> it. Good stuff. Um, well, this was illuminating. I, again, have had my mind and perception changed. And I think it's one of the best things about wine and tasting wine and going back to visit things that maybe you didn't like before, yeah. didn't realize, didn't appreciate. And obviously very, very special wines. So really excited to get a chance to taste them. Um, speaking of tasting and glasses, I did just want to point out, we switched our glassware last week into these beautiful Spiegelows. Um, these are Austrian glassware company. They're fantastic for wine tasting. We sell them in the store. They're $8.99 line price. There's a white wine, a red wine, a great big Bordeaux glass, and a champagne glass as well. So wine does taste better out of nice glasses. It does. It's a thing. It's for real. Um, so I highly recommend trying those. And uh, an unsponsored toe. These are my my personal tasting glasses that I travel with to all my exams. So I, I love Spiegel. They're, they're great glasses. Tried, tested, trusted, and yep. true. Uh, well, Cardine, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Um, we will have a little display of these wines up by the register. Those will be ready for you to pick in, pick up, swoop in, and grab them whenever you are ready. Um, or in Swift Wines, there's more where this came from, and hopefully we'll get a chance to taste those soon. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, cheers. <laughs> <laughs>